Chapter 12 From the Wilderness to Cana of Galilee We now go forth with Jesus to behold his wonderful works and hear his wonderful words for the next three years and a half. We are not of those who say they can do without his miracles. On the contrary, they are indispensable. It is his miracles that tell us he is from the Father. As he said, The works that I do in my Father's name, the same bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. The absence of miracles would be the absence of proof that he is Christ, the Savior of the world. Jesus admitted that, in the absence of a miracle, the Jews would have been without sin in rejecting him. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But, say some, Christ is so beautiful in himself, his teaching is so exalted above all men's before or since, that miracle cannot add to his excellence. What shall we say in answer? That his beauty can be improved? That his excellence can be added to? No. But is beauty enough? Is excellence all that we need in one who offers himself as our hope? Need we not a guarantee that with the beauty and the excellence there is power? Need we not assurance that the beauty is not that of the transient rainbow or the golden sunset or the blooming garden or the flowery lea? The question suggests the answer. Those who set light by the miracles, especially those who would dispense with them, especially the greatest of them, Christ's own resurrection, would give us a Christ whom we might admire but could not trust, a Christ whom we might copy as a beautiful model but to whom we could not look as one having authority and power to save all who come unto God by him. Christ's reply to John's messengers remains full of the power that was in it when uttered in the presence of those who had seen his miracles. Go tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. The men who saw such things could carry back but one answer to John's question, Art thou he that should come? And we, who authentically hear of them, can have no other. They bring with them the conviction, uttered by Nicodemus, No man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him and the wonder expressed by the cured blind man to the Jews, who skeptically interrogated him concerning Jesus. Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. True it is, that Jesus seemed to disparage the miracles sometimes, as when he said, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. But this was in rebuke of the mere sight-seeing curiosity, whose appetite is for the marvelous, rather than for the meaning of it. This is in no way inconsistent with the place he assigns to miracle, as the evidence that God has sent him. Jesus, having successfully come through the trial in the wilderness, returns in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. On the way, he revisits John, whose labors continued on the banks of the Jordan till his imprisonment. John sees him approach, and salutes him in the hearing of those standing by. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, etc. And he proceeds to relate what occurred at his baptism, concluding with the words, And I saw and bear record that this was the Son of God. How long Jesus stayed with John that day is not stated. Perhaps a short time, perhaps half an hour. At the end of that time, he would retire either to the open country or to the house in which he would stay while in the neighborhood. At all events, next day he was near John again, and John, looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Here we seem to see Jesus in the act of walking. We naturally clutch at everything that helps us to realize him in the dark days of our widowhood, whom, having not seen, we love. But we shall see him yet, walking, and sitting, and talking, and eating, and performing all the acts of life, 
with all the grace of noble innocence, love, and power. Two of John's disciples, who had evidently pondered what they heard John say on the previous day, hearing him now again call attention to Jesus as he passed, walked after Jesus. When they had done so for a little time, Jesus turned and asked them what they wanted. They scarcely knew what to say, but they asked him where he was staying. Jesus did not tell them where, but asked them to come and see, probably because the house where he was staying would not be capable of description in the way of address. It would be one of the many temporary booths erected without much plan or order all around the place where John was baptizing, and let to visitors from a distance. A dwelling place among such structures could only be got at by the help of a guide. This guide was Jesus himself, with whom they came and saw where he dwelt, and not only saw, but abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour, that is, four o'clock in the afternoon. What an honor for these two young men, Andrew and John. Christ's guest, under Christ's own roof, even if only a hired one, for one night? What would we not give for such an opportunity now? He is away, and we are out in the dark, loving and longing and seeking, but unable to find our beloved in all the city. We are like Solomon's sister spouse. Yea, we are she, or constituents of her. My beloved hath withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed while he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him back, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if ye find my beloved, that ye tell him I am sick of love. What is thy beloved more than another beloved? Well, our opportunity is coming, and is not very far off. If we are accepted, Christ will actually be the host of the great house into which we shall be invited, as he himself has promised. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself, and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. What passed between Jesus and these two during the evening, night, and morning they were together, the first of the disciples to be called to his side, would be interesting to know, but we are not informed. Whatever it was, the words and deportment of Christ, and everything connected with him, were sufficient to confirm the conviction created in their minds by John's testimony that he was indeed the Lamb of God. This is shown by what they did the very first thing next day. Andrew first findeth his own brother Simon, Peter, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah. Peter lent a willing ear and allowed himself to be taken by Andrew into Christ's presence. This is Peter's first appearance upon the scene, from which his name was never afterwards to disappear. We are informed that Jesus beheld him and addressed him. This suggests a fastening of Christ's eyes on Peter in a penetrative, contemplative manner. Jesus had before him the disciple to whom he was to entrust the keys of the kingdom, and who was to be a foremost figure in the work of planting the name of Christ in the earth, and who was to glorify God in especially agonizing death, like his master. Jesus knew all this, for, as John takes pains to tell us in his second chapter, he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. He knew that this ardent, impetuous Simon, faithful but infirm, was first of the twelve foundations upon which the holy city was to be built. That he should fasten his eyes on him, when first introduced to him, was natural, and also that he should address him in words few but full of meaning with regard to Peter's future. Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, a stone or rock. Christ's words were always few, but pregnant. He could deliver a long discourse, but in colloquy his words were brief and terse. Solomon says, 
A fool is known by the multitude of his words. The reverse was illustrated in Christ. He did not apostrophize Peter in long-winded obscurities after the manner of pretenders in all ages, but fixed his place in one word. This was the third day after his return from the temptation. The next day, the fourth, Jesus desired to depart from Galilee, about eighty miles to the north of the scene of John's labors, where he had begun to gather the disciples prepared for him by John. Before making a start, he wished to call one or two others to his side who were still in that neighborhood. He went forth, and without much search, found Philip, who was evidently in attendance upon John's teaching. To him he simply said, Follow me. The words would be said in a way to mean much. By look and tone they would be made to say, I am he to whom John bear testimony, as ye know. I am he whom ye seek. I am he whom God hath sent. I am the Messiah. The Messiah has need of you. Come. Philip had evidently been in such a prepared state of mind that it needed not another word. Philip was a fellow townsman of Andrew and Peter, who both belonged to Bethsaida, a fishing town on the northeastern shore of the lake of Gennesaret. With them he would be acquainted. With them he had evidently kept company in submission to John's baptism. He would all the more readily respond to the command of Christ that Peter and Andrew were before him with their allegiance. His obedience was prompt and his conviction ripe. The first thing he did was to communicate his discovery of Christ to Nathaniel of Cana, who was also in the throng of attendance upon John the Baptist. Cana of Galilee was not far from Bethsaida, and the probability is that Philip and Nathanael were acquainted. That he should go straight to Nathanael would prove this. The communication he made was indicative of the acquaintance they all had with the scriptures of Moses and the prophets, and of the expectation of the Messiah's appearance, which they entertained in common as the result of their readings of them. We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, that is, the promised seed of Abraham, the prophet like unto Moses, the son covenanted to David, the Messiah foreshown by all the prophets. It was good news that Philip made known to Nathanael, but Philip made an addition that excited his incredulity. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Not that he was really the son of Joseph, but this was his social status in the town and neighborhood where he lived, the reputed eldest son of Joseph. It was the town that staggered Nathanael. He knew Nazareth, it was not many miles from Cana, and he knew it was a poor place every way, secluded among the hills, and having very little of that intercourse with the outer world which is necessary to sharpen village people. Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth, he said? Philip, as a young fisherman living at Bethsaida on the sea, probably did not know so much about it as Nathanael, and could not debate the affair with him in the abstract. But as regarded Jesus, he could give the best of all answers. Come and see. Whatever might be the case with regard to Nazareth and Nazarenes in general, he was quite sure that, in Jesus, the best thing that had ever come out of anywhere for man had come out of Nazareth. He invited Nathaniel to satisfy himself by personal inspection, the very best advice that can be given on this subject ever since. Though Christ is not on the earth to be looked at as Nathaniel could look at him, there are monuments and mementos of him extent which make the examination of him possible, notably the scriptures. Any man who will to the extent of his opportunity do what Philip told Nathaniel to do must, if he have an open eye and loving heart, come to the conclusion that Philip announced. Nathaniel was a man of this stamp. He went with Philip to see Jesus. Jesus made the way very plain for Nathanael, because he was a childlike man, desiring only to know the truth. Probably, Jesus does the same yet, though in a different way of working, as his different relation to things on earth requires. Jesus, seeing Nathanael approach, and knowing all about him, as he did about Peter, opens the way for him by saluting him. Not with a compliment, as some think, but with a simple declaration of truth. Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. Nathanael did not know Jesus, and supposed that Jesus could not know him. He therefore, in surprise at his salutation, 
asks him how he knew him. Christ's answer spoke volumes to Nathanael. Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. In view of all that had gone before, the arrival of the time for the Messiah to appear, of John the Baptist's declaration that the Messiah was in their midst, of the divine identification of Jesus and the act of baptism six weeks previously, of which Nathaniel would hear if he did not witness it, and of Philip's information, this incident was irresistible. Nathaniel could not avoid the conviction, which he immediately expressed. Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus then volunteered a gracious comment. Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Much that is sublimely interesting is suggested by this whole incident. Jesus saw Nathanael at a distance, and through natural obstructions, which a man possessing merely natural power could not have done. This power of the Spirit of God to extend natural faculty is illustrated more than once in the history of God's work upon earth. The king of Syria, perplexed by the baffling of his plans against Israel through the oozing out of secret information, was informed by his servants, to whom he at least appealed for the discovery of the traitors. Elisha the prophet that is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. On Jesus, the Spirit of God, after his baptism, rested without measure. He was therefore able to see as God sees, who says, can any hide himself in secret places that I should not see him? Nathanael recognized in this an evidence of his messiahship. But Jesus overwhelmed his faith, as we might say, by telling him of coming manifestations of a far higher order. Seeing Nathanael under the fig tree was a case of Jesus seeing. But Jesus told Nathanael of what Nathanael would see in the day of God's finished purpose in Christ. Heaven open and the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is suggestive of very great things. We are accustomed to conceive of the universe and its possibilities from the standpoint of our mortal faculties. Are these the highest faculties? What man of ordinary intellectual prudence and information would be guilty of affirming such a thing? Are the powers and faculties of mortal man upon the earth the utmost development that is possible of the senses of seeing and hearing? The question suggests its own answer. There are higher things in heaven and earth than mortal man dreams of. Jesus touches some of these in his answer to Nathanael. We have occasional glimpses in other parts of the scripture. Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see, said Elisha concerning his alarmed servitor when a Syrian host besieged them at Dothan. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. They that be with us, said Elisha, are more than they that be with them. When heaven is open in the sense of Christ's intimation to Nathanael, that is, when our eyes are open to an enlarged vision of things, the universe will not seem the yawning, empty abyss it looks to mortal eye and heart. In the spirit, which fills all space, we shall feel one with all, and at home everywhere, and in connection with the busy angelic multitude who are meanwhile hid from our eyes. The earth, in open communion with heaven, through the visible commerce of angels, converging upon Christ as the one head, under whom are all things to be confederate, is the vision shown to us in the words of Jesus to the guileless, believing Nathanaels of every age. Jesus now departs to Galilee. Whether accompanied or not by the five who had just become persuaded of his Messiahship, and who were afterwards appointed apostles, Andrew, John, Simon, Philip, and Nathanael, does not appear. If they accompanied him, it would be as fellow travelers homeward, for we afterwards find them in their several places of stay, and Jesus at Nazareth. Jesus was not long home from his six or eight weeks' absence when he received an invitation to attend a marriage at Cana, a village a few miles to the north of Nazareth. His mother and such disciples as had already attached themselves to him, 
probably during the few years' private tuition preceding his baptism by John, were included in the invitation. He went. It was probably the marriage of some near relation, and being a semi-public occasion, he chose to take occasion of it to make a beginning of the miracles which were to manifest forth his glory to the nation at large. Being all assembled, the company, which was probably larger than anticipated, ran short of wine. Mary, who had pondered all things in her heart concerning her firstborn from the very beginning, appears, with a woman's quick intuition, to have formed the conclusion that Jesus was now possessed of power to do all things. She told him suggestively, They have no wine. Jesus answers abruptly, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. There must have been a reason for this apparent impatience. We are probably not far wrong in attributing it to the difference between the view that Jesus would have in putting forth miraculous power and that which would be entertained by those who wished and saw and admired it. Christ would realize that this exercise of miraculous power was a condescension on the part of God for the purpose of manifesting and establishing his anointed one with a view to his own great purpose towards man, a purpose of love and salvation truly, but first of exalting and hallowing his own great name and condemning the universal insubordination of man. Miraculous power would therefore be, in Christ's estimation, an implement of holiness. But Mary's view for the moment appears to have been that it would be a human convenience, and, likely enough, there was mixed up with this view a little of a mother's pride in the greatness of her son. Christ had proposed to supply the wine, but he would not do it at human call or to gratify human complacence. He therefore answered his mother in a way that, in modern times, would be considered equivalent to a snub. Mr. Gladstone says he does not understand Christ's deportment in this instance. This shows that Mr. Gladstone is a mere Greek. To an Israelite indeed, with whom God is all in all, and man an earthen vessel of divine fabrication, there can be none of the difficulties that beset the whole subject of Christ for minds imbued with the prevalent idea that man is of immortal status in the universe and the fountain of intellectual and moral excellence. Mary gathered from Christ's manner, notwithstanding, that he intended to supply the wine. So she said to the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. The servants, all alacrity, hear him tell them by and by to fill with water the six stone water pots that were set near the door, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews. They do so at once, to the brim, and doubtless wait with fixed attention for the next direction. Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear. The ruler of the feast finds that what the servants have brought is the very best wine. He is ignorant of its origin, but it is so good that he feels impelled to remark that the custom was to bring out the good wine first, but here the good had come last. It must have been prime liquor to have evoked such a tribute from a connoisseur who had partaken freely of other wine during the evening. His verdict is a confutation of the extreme teetotal suggestion that the wine Jesus made was the unfermented juice of the grape. An unfermented vegetable juice would have been the reverse of appreciated by men who had well drunk of ordinary wines. What Jesus made was wine, and that the very best. Vegetable juice is not wine. It must undergo vinous fermentation before it can be so designated. This, however, is merely an aside. The marvel consisted of the instantaneous transformation of common water into rich wine. The nature of the marvel has been discussed in The Visible Hand of God. Jesus tells us how it was done. I cast out demons by the Spirit of God. It was not magic. It was the exercise of the power by which all things have been made and in which they subsist. This power is in all the universe, for the Spirit fills immensity. But no man can use it, except he to whom God gives the power. For the power is his, and in him. He gave this power to Jesus, and the works done by him were, therefore, the Father's works, as Jesus said. 
They were miracles, wonders, and signs which God did by him in the midst of Israel. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Before this, the few disciples that had begun to gather round Jesus had only the testimony of John the Baptist to rest on, strengthened by such arguments from Moses and the prophets, as Jesus might bring to bear on them. But now they saw with their own eyes the manifestation of the power that was latent within him as the anointed of God, and which afterwards blazed forth as a great light in all the coasts of Israel, drawing multitudes after him and filling the land, and at the last, the world, with his fame. Chapter 13 The First Visit to Jerusalem Nicodemus From Cana of Galilee, where the first miracle had been performed, in the turning of water into wine, Jesus, his mother, his brethren, and his disciples, went to Capernaum, instead of returning to Nazareth. Capernaum was situate on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, near its northern end, and from the description left us by Josephus, was a busy and thriving place in a most pleasant and salubrious situation. Here, we are informed, Jesus and his company continued not many days, but went up to the Passover at Jerusalem. But why did they come to Capernaum, instead of returning to Nazareth? Probably because the time to attend the feast was too near to make it worth while to go back to the seclusion of Nazareth, from which they would so soon have to re-emerge. At Capernaum, they were on the highway of public traffic, on which so many traveling companies would soon set out to the holy city. With these, they would journey along the valley of the Jordan, reaching Jerusalem in two or three days. Arrived there, Jesus performed an act which many have been unable to understand. Finding the approaches and outer court of the temple occupied by traders of various descriptions, he made a scourge of small cords and drove them all out, overthrowing the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and clearing out droves of sheep and oxen. The apparent harshness of this procedure shows in a strong light when we recollect how such intruders came to be there. Sheep and oxen were required for the offerings of those who attended the feast, doves, likewise, for the poorer of the community, who were not able to offer an expensive animal. Many of these, coming from long distances, would be unable to bring the sacrificial animals with them, but would come provided with money, as the law of Moses prescribed, to buy, offer, and eat on the spot. The provision of these animals for sale in the neighborhood of the temple would therefore be a great public convenience. So, with the money changing, Many would come to the feast unprovided with money current in Jerusalem and eligible for the tribute payable by every son of Abraham to the priests for the maintenance of the temple service. They would have money, but money belonging to a distant province and not taken in the holy city. How were such to obtain suitable coin without the money changer? It would seem on the face of things as if it were not only an unobjectionable but an indispensable and praiseworthy institution that the dealers in all these things should offer their wares to the frequenters of the temple. The words which Jesus addressed to these dealers, as he broke into and upset their arrangements, indicate another view of the situation, and one which probably none but himself entertained. Take these things hence. Make not my father's house and house of merchandise. The action and the words would savor of intemperate zeal in the eyes of merely natural thinkers. Zeal there certainly was. The disciples remembered that it was written of him, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Intemperate zeal there was not. Zeal, founded on a reasonable appreciation of things, is not intemperate, however strong. Men universally recognize zeal in a good cause to be a beautiful thing. They do not universally discern the cause of the zeal, in this case, to be good. The zeal of thine house. This kind of zeal does not appeal to most men. The nature and source of it, Jesus made manifest on a later occasion. When acting a similar part, he called attention to a statement in the prophets. Is it not written, 
My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Jesus recognized something inconsistent with the true object of the temple service in the eager turning of the supply of its physical requirements into an occasion for making money. He would have had men come with supplies in the spirit of service, not with the object of gain. There is a time for everything. His sympathy was with the praying, not with the trading. His sympathy amounted to zeal, a zeal so intense as to be an eating-up zeal, an executive zeal, a zeal impelling to action. He flourished a whip of small cords about the ears of the chaffering rabble. He glanced scorching rebuke at them as he overturned their tables and scattered their money and with imperative gesture ordered them all out. He apostrophized them in terms that would be considered by the majority of educated men in our day transcendent rhodomontite, but which reveal a glimpse of highest wisdom. It is a side of Christ's character entirely overlooked in popular presentments of him. It is one that has a useful place. Christ is the model for his people. Imitators of Christ is one of the revised version definitions of true disciples. The imitation ought not to be confined to one phase. He is to be imitated in his zeal for God as well as in his compassion for man. Not that we have his authority or his opportunity, but that we must have his spirit, which, in a day like ours, will find scope in an earnest contention for divine faith and appointments against the countless corruptions of a community which owns his name, but is reprobate to all his requirements. It is a singular thing to contemplate that this, at this time, unknown young mechanic, for he was only thirty, in the garb and dialect of a provincial Galilean, should be able to overawe and coerce a crowd of Jerusalem Jews in the face of the temple authorities, and actually expel them from the precincts of the temple, with the loss of their money probably in many cases. Some artificial suggestions have been made about the power or moral influence over guilty consciences. We may be quite sure that this had nothing to do with Christ's ascendancy over a crowd of huckstering traders who are notoriously insensible to moral influences of any kind, and who, in this case, were the lowest class in a whole nation of whom it is declared that their hearts had become gross, and their eyes closed, and their ears dull of hearing. We must look higher than to human susceptibility to find the explanation of this heroic situation. We must look to the holder of the whip of small cords, and not to the cowering crew who betook themselves, abashed from his presence. There is no lack of explanation here. God was in him, in the immeasurable abiding presence of the Spirit. This power, directed indignantly, was irresistible. It paralyzed the hands of his enemies on more occasions than one. He was enabled to make a lane through their banks on the brow of the Nazareth Heights, and to arrest their stone-filled hands in Jerusalem when his cutting words had goaded them to deadly intent, and to throw a whole band of soldiers on their faces when they came to arrest him. The power of God, which was often present to heal, was always present to protect his anointed until his hour had come. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, is the prophetic description which explains all. The fire of God's indignation streamed from his eyes upon the profane multitude that were defiling his courts, and therefore they were powerless to raise a finger against a young man whom otherwise they would not only have disregarded, but overpowered, whose interference they would have resented as intolerable presumption. When they had recovered themselves a little, they asked a token of his authority to do such things. His answer combined obscurity and pointedness in a remarkable manner. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The obscurity lay in his apparently referring to the literal temple whose holiness he was vindicating. The pointedness lay in the fact that his resurrection in three days, after they should put him to death, would be the unanswerable demonstration of his authority to do everything. Some have asked, why should his answer have been obscure at all? Even the disciples were impressed on this point. Why speakest thou to them in parables? 
Such was their question on a subsequent occasion. His answer may not seem much of an explanation to some, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted, etc. Why should the teaching of Jesus have been couched in a form calculated to obstruct the light? The answer may be learned from the prophets. For a long season Israel had turned a deaf ear to God's expostulations. There is a limit to the divine patience. Therefore we read, Forasmuch as this people draw near me with their mouths, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men, therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. The Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes. When Jesus appeared in Israel, their spiritual reprobateness had reached a climax. His mission was in harmony with the time. His fan is in his hand, said John the Baptist, and he shall thoroughly purge his floor, and gather his wheat into the garner, and burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The prophet Malachi had said, He is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages. It was partly in execution of this mission that he expelled the traders from the temple, and that he systematically veiled his meaning in parabolic discourse. It was a time of retribution, which culminated in forty years, in the fiery overthrow of the state and the destruction of the people. They imagined he meant that he could rebuild Herod's temple in three days if it were to be destroyed. Forty and six years, said they, was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Jesus knew of his work from the beginning. No part of it was an afterthought. His death was before him as a known appointment of the fathers, and his resurrection the end of which he never lost sight. He steadily pressed forward towards it in the midst of all the blindness and confusion and misunderstanding that prevailed around him, deflecting not in the least from the path he was called upon in his faith to follow. In this, he hath left us an example that we should follow in his steps. We are not told what rejoinder Jesus made to the incredulous enquiry of the Jews. Probably he observed silence, often the best answer. His words, not understood, remained with some who heard them, for they were made the pretext of an accusation against him, when at the last he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. They were for this purpose perverted. He was accused of having said that he would destroy the temple. A slight change in words makes a wonderful difference to the meaning sometimes, and enmity never hesitates at changes that are even not slight. The words were not understood by his disciples any more than by his enemies. The words even passed from their memory. They came back afterwards. When he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. They remembered because they were helped to remember. Jesus had promised that when he was glorified, he would send the Holy Spirit to them, who should bring all things to their remembrance whatsoever he had spoken unto them and guide them into all truth. This promise was fulfilled, so that the apostles were able to speak and write unerringly concerning the wonderful words and works of the Son of God. Jesus remained in Jerusalem some little time after the temple incident. We find him working miracles in the presence of the crowds who were present during the days of the feast of the Passover. We are not informed what the miracles were, they were probably of the same character as those he afterwards performed in Galilee, of which we read that he healed all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Whatever they were, they produced the effect they were calculated to produce and designed to produce. Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. 
They were mostly the common people of whom this is testified. Had Jesus been of the character imagined by some, who, wishing to get rid of his divinity, invent theories that bring him into the category of human aims and errors, he would have laid eager hold of the popular faith thus created by his miracles, and would have fanned and encouraged it. Instead, Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. He knew that the newly born faith of the many referred to was a mere effervescence of sensationalism, the admiration of the marvelous and the excitement of novelty, and not the appreciation of the divine aims with which the miracles were wrought, an empty, ugly thing compared with the fear, faith, and obedience of God in righteousness, holiness, and love which it was the aim of Jesus to induce in the people who were to be taken out for his name. He therefore stood irresponsibly apart from the popular enthusiasm, aiming merely to do the work God had given him to do in the laying of the foundation of the coming glory of God on the earth. The ruling class stood aloof altogether, but there were some among them who could not close their eyes to the extraordinary things that were being enacted before them. Though not convinced that this man, introduced by John the Baptist, was the very Christ, they could not help thinking the hand of God was in the matter in some way. Among these was Nicodemus, a man of the Pharisees, a ruler of the Jews. His earnest curiosity desired a closer view, but not in public. He did not wish to compromise himself with an affair of which he was in doubt, and which was odiously regarded by his class. He came to Jesus by night. By what means he obtained an introduction, and where the interview took place, we are not informed, and it is not important. Such particulars, bulking large and human narratives, are kept in their true insignificant place in a divinely written record. We may be sure that a man of Nicodemus's position would have no difficulty in finding his way to the presence of a carpenter. Seated before him, by the light of a flickering eastern lamp, Nicodemus, probably after some unrecorded preliminaries, unburdens the leading feeling of his mind. Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. It is presumable that Nicodemus imagined that this was a great concession on his part. He might even, probably did, think it would be acceptable to Christ as an important patronage of his cause at the hands of a ruler of the Jews, opening the way, perhaps, to that establishment of the kingly power of the Messiah, which they were all looking for, and which all thought in common would immediately appear. The presence of this complacent and purely human view of the situation would account for the abrupt and apparently otherwise irrelevant rejoinder of Christ. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was hoping to see the kingdom of God as a Jew according to the flesh and perhaps as a result of lending his official influence to the Messiah, if this were he. Christ's declaration was therefore of a very pointed application. But Nicodemus did not understand it. He thought he was speaking literally. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus explains that this is not what he means, but that nevertheless there is a second birth of which a man must indispensably be the subject before he can inherit the kingdom. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. If we suppose Nicodemus here asking, Why? We may see the point of his next observation. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. But again, a question. Why is this fact, that that which is born of the flesh is flesh, a reason going to show the necessity for being born again? It is as if Jesus had said, No wonder you must be born again, seeing that having only been born of the flesh... Ye are only flesh, which cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Paul indeed uses these latter words, 
flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. If we ask, why? He answers, corruption doth not inherit incorruption. If we ask, is man corruption? We do not require to wait for an answer. We know it. If we ask, is the kingdom of God incorruption? Though we have to wait the answer, the answer is equally clear and certain. The prophets tell us that the kingdom which the God of heaven will set up on earth when the human kingdoms have run their course is to be given to the saints of the Most High, and that it is not to be left to other people, but will last forever, shall not pass away. Of his kingdom there shall be no end. Consequently, a man, to inherit the kingdom, must be immortal. Jesus says its inheritors will be so, in saying they shall not die any more. Now a man merely born of the flesh is mortal and corruptible, as we all know. He has no element of immortality in him. Therefore, he must be the subject of a great change before he is fit to enter into the kingdom, which requires a man to be immortal in order to inherit it. This great change Jesus describes as a being born of water and of the Spirit. Why he should so characterize it becomes apparent only when certain principles of the truth are understood. It is one of those first principles that men are not born children of God, but children of Adam and heirs of the death that came by him. It is another that God proposes to generate from among this death-doomed race a family for himself whom he will glorify with salvation. It is another that the mode he has chosen in the development of this family is to present the gospel for acceptance and to require the assumption of the name of Christ in baptism. It is another that those submitting to faith in Christ Jesus are considered as having entered the new family for the first time. Begotten by the word, brought to bear upon their mind, they have in baptism been born of water, but are not yet finally incorporate in the family of God. At this stage, they may perish, as Paul recognizes. At the return of Christ, they have to appear before him in judgment, to be dealt with according to the state of the account they will be called upon to render. If this is not acceptable, they are rejected and depart to death. If it be such as the Lord can approve, they become the subject of that change which Paul calls the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. As the result of this physical change which is effected by the Spirit in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, they become finally and unalterably sons of God. They are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. This consummation of their adoption is figuratively compared to a birth, as in the case of baptism. Baptism is not a literal birth, but as it is the act by which a man, not a child of God, becomes such. It is a natural figure which speaks of it as a birth of water. So the operation of the Spirit of God upon the mortal nature of the accepted saints is not a literal birth, but as it is the act by which a son of the earth becomes a son of heaven, so it is natural to speak of it as a birth, a being born of the Spirit. Without this divine birth in two stages, it is impossible that any man can enter upon the possession of the kingdom which the Lord will establish at his coming. The administration of that kingdom will require powers that do not belong to mortal man. It will require such a knowledge of the thoughts of men, as Jesus evinced, and such a capability of eluding human observation and control as he manifested after his resurrection. The rulers of the age to come must be independent of man as the wind. As Jesus added, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. With the ideas that Nicodemus had of a kingdom of God to be administered by mortal men, it is not wonderful that he was surprised at such doctrine. How can these things be? said he. Christ answered as if he had said, How can they not be? Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? As much as to say that, as a man in Israel whose position presumed an acquaintance with the scriptures of Moses and the prophets, 
He ought to have known these things. There is much more in Moses and the prophets than people are aware of. It requires close and constant reading to become acquainted with all that they reveal. The majority of people read them scarcely at all, and those who do read them mostly do so without discernment. Nicodemus, from his position, must have been a reader, but evidently he was in the position of those rulers of Jerusalem described by Paul when he said that they knew not the voices of the prophets which were read in their synagogues every Sabbath day. Jesus found the resurrection proved in part of Moses, where the priests could not discern it, that is, in God's declaration that he was the God of three men who were at the time dead. By the same process of reasoning, the spiritual and immortal nature of the rulers of the future age is deducible from many parts of the prophets. Had Nicodemus been an enlightened student of them, he would have known these things, and would have at once recognized and endorsed Christ's sayings as the truth. Chapter 14 To Galilee, through Samaria, via Jacob's Well There was no further conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus after the point reached at the end of the last chapter. What followed was in the nature of a discourse by Christ, uninterrupted by any questions or remarks by Nicodemus, who was probably silenced by the authoritative manner of his interlocutor and by the rebuke his ignorance had just suffered. Christ, besides appealing by implication to the prophets for proof of the necessity for spirit birth, proceeds to allege his own authority and the tangible ground of it. We speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. This is a characteristic of Bible revelation. It is a matter of knowing as men know anything, and of having seen as men see anything. It is not an affair of what is called subjective experience, as when a man dreams. When a man dreams, the sensation is subjective to himself. It is not open and obvious to anyone present at the same time. But in the case of Revelation, the things revealed were things palpable and open to view. Bible revelation is not a matter of opinion founded either upon personal speculation or upon arguments presented by others, nor of conviction founded upon evidence. It is an affair of personal knowledge, as when a man sees and hears and has experience, as of his own business or family affairs, for example. Jesus and John, for presumably they were the we whose testimony was known to Jerusalem and not believed, were personally acquainted with the matters they spoke of. They had not received them from hearsay or persuasion. The word of the Lord had come as actually to John as the word of a man comes to his neighbor. John had seen the Spirit descend upon Jesus as really as a man sees the lightning on the day of thunder. It had happened in accordance with previous notice as practically and really as an eclipse follows an almanac date. He had heard the words of the divine proclamation as really as any man ever hears words uttered in his hearing. Jesus had himself also seen and heard all these things and much more besides, behind all which was the actual voice of the Spirit, audible to him in the inner temple of his being. It was knowledge and experience that John and Jesus testified to unbelieving Israel. Jesus now pressed this home upon Nicodemus, and at the same time emphasized another thought. The testimony in question had related to things and incidents on earth, but there was a day coming when Jesus would tell of a higher class of things, of things related to the heaven to which he should ascend. If Nicodemus and his class were incredulous of divine things in their first stage, how would they be able to believe in those things testified of in their second stage, in the day of heaven open, spoken of to Nathaniel? He anticipates the question how any man on earth could know of things in heaven. He adds, no man had been to heaven to learn. At the same time, he foreshadowed his own coming ascent thither. He did so in language a little obscure. It reads in another version, 
No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. The obscurity is increased by the present participle, being, having been turned in translation into the present indicative, is. The Son of Man being in the heaven gives us the point of view of the coming down. He is not in heaven till he ascends, and he cannot descend till he ascends. The idea is more easy to catch when freely paraphrased thus. It will not be affirmable that any man has ascended up to heaven until the Son of Man, having ascended thither, and being there for a while, descends to the earth again. He will then be able to say, I have been to heaven, and the only man who has ever been there. For though Enoch and Elijah have been away from the earth, they have not been to the presence of the Father, and cannot testify of the things that are there. Jesus, when on earth, said to his disciples, I go to him that sent me. When he returns, he will be able to say, I have been to him that sent me. We who now live in the interval of his absence can see the bearing of this. He is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and principalities and powers being made subject unto him. At his return, he will be able to tell us unutterable things. The wide universe and its movements are a great mystery to created intelligence. Still more, the residence and surroundings of the personal father deity, the fountain and source of all power and being. What may we not expect in the way of enlightenment on these stupendous themes from him who not only has power to bestow such capacity of understanding in the change from the mortal to the immortal, but who has been basking for eighteen centuries in the inner sunshine of the Father's glory, and who intimately knows the highest things. The other matters glanced at in Christ's discourse to Nicodemus belong to first principles and present no feature of difficulty. Jesus appears to have closed the interview with a mild rebuke of Nicodemus for coming to him by night. He that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. The open, courageous course expressed by the English word straightforward is doubtless the one that most commends itself to God and man. The timid patronage of truth that shrinks from human knowledge is of little value to anyone. It is best that a man's conviction be known. It is demoralizing to seek concealment. It is best to confess Christ before men. The only excuse for carefulness would be uncertainty. A man thinking a hated thing to be the truth, but not being sure, would naturally and justifiably avoid an open connection, or what might be construed to be such, until investigation had satisfied him. This was doubtless partly the case with Nicodemus. His brethren in the priesthood held or professed that Jesus was a deceiver. This would make Nicodemus feel, in a degree, uncertain. At the same time, the miracles of Jesus convinced him that God was with him for some purpose or other. He therefore looked closer, and apparently at last with decisive results, for we find him afterwards taking part with the people in favor of Christ, and at last no more by night, but openly identifying himself with him at a moment when the death of Christ seemed to confute all his claims. Retiring from Jerusalem after the interview with Nicodemus, Jesus, accompanied by a few of his disciples, repairs to the neighborhood of Jordan, and there remains some time. He teaches, and baptizes those who submit to his teaching. He did not personally immerse believers. The act of immersion was performed by his disciples, but done by his direction and authority, it was considered as done by him. The non-performance of baptism by Christ's actual hands is an intimation at the very start that its virtue depends in no way upon the administrator. Sacramentalism is outside the scope of the system of Christ. The spirit of his doctrine is this, that we must believe what God says with the simplicity of little children and perform what he commands in the same humble spirit. The idea of baptism or any other institution owing its efficacy to the ministration of a particular operator, belongs to the system of spiritual sorcery 
that has since taken such a deep root in the world as foretold. When Christ, to whom John gave testimony, appeared in the same capacity as John himself, that is, as a teacher and a baptizer, the people naturally turned in greater numbers to Jesus than to John. This was no distress to John, though his attention was called to it. It simply led him to reaffirm his testimony to Jesus. He must increase, but I must decrease. But the fact was noticed by the Pharisees, who from that day forth observed the progress of Jesus with jealous eyes. They feared the influence he was gaining with the people. Had they known, they need not have feared, for Jesus had no disposition to use or encourage the favor of the populace. On several occasions, he distinctly declined their advances, knowing that not then or by them would his kingdom be established, but after a long time and when suffering had prepared the way. But this they did not understand, and consequently they began to watch him with unfriendly eyes. Jesus, knowing their state of mind, went away from the neighborhood of their power. He left Judea and started on his return to Galilee. Why should the feelings of enemies affect the movements of one who had the power of God upon him, and who could not be touched till his hour had come? It was but a preferring of circumstances favorable for his work. The work he had to do was designed to influence a suitable class who were to become his disciples, and this work was best to be done in peace. He chose peace when he could have it. The time came when he could no longer have it. But then his work was nearly done. At the moment in question, he was but entering upon it, and therefore he preferred to get away from the heat and the excitement and the sense of insecurity caused to the multitude by the opposition of the scribes and Pharisees. To get to Galilee, it was necessary to pass through the province of Samaria, which lay between Judea and Galilee. On the way through Samaria, an interesting incident occurred in the narration of which, by John, we get closer views of Jesus than in some parts of the apostolic narrative. We find him on the road, wearied with his journey. This, in passing, tells us interestingly more things than one. It not only tells us of one touched with the feeling of our infirmity, but it shows us that the Spirit of God, though resting on him without measure, was not available for his personal needs during the days of his flesh. The Pharisees embittered his dying moments by shouting, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Their cruel taunt carried a certain truth with it concerning his whole career. He gave strength to the weak. He healed the diseased. He raised the dead. But his own personal needs and sorrows, he endured in the weakness of his mortal flesh, supported by that faith in the Father, which he possessed in a measure transcending that of all his disciples. The power of God placed at his disposal was for the manifestation of the name of God, and not for the supply of his personal needs. So here we have him toiling along the road in a burning Syrian sun, footsore and weary, and sitting down to rest in the neighborhood of Sychar, or Sychem, where Jacob dwelt in the land of promise as in a strange country some seventeen hundred years before. He sits down by a well, a well that Jacob had made in those far-off days, and which had retained his name during the long interval. His disciples go away into the city to replenish the exhausted commissariat. The well exists to this day. It is in a valley, and in full view of Mounts Ebel and Gerizim, which stand north and south of Shechem. The surrounding scenery is impressive, and has witnessed many events in Israel's history. Chief among them was the muster of the tribes here, when Joshua brought them into the land. In imposing array, they stood six of the tribes on one of these hills, and six on the other, while the priests, standing between, recite the principal points in the law, to each of which the people shouted a hearty Amen. That was very different from the scene now before us, a solitary man, sitting tired at the well, in the midst of the quietness and solitude of the picturesque valley, overlooked by two majestic hills. The two scenes were not unconnected, however. They were parts, though widely separate, in the one great work which God, through Israel, 
is working upon earth for the realization of his own object in the creation of it. In the one case, he was instructing and developing the nation for the work before it. In the other, he was, last of all, speaking to them by his Son, the heir of all things, preparatory to the long reign of desolation about to be established in the land in punishment of all their sins. While Jesus sat thus on the well, a woman from the town approaches to draw water. The woman is a woman of Samaria, a descendant of those Assyrian colonists whom Shalmaneser settled in Samaria when the ten tribes had been taken away nearly nine hundred years before. She is one of those, therefore, with whom the Jews would have no dealings, though the Samaritans adopted the traditions of the land and claimed kinship. This fact supplies the key to the conversation that ensued. Jesus, being thirsty, asks the woman for a drink of water. The woman expresses surprise that a Jew should ask a drink from a Samaritan. We note, by the way, that the woman recognized in Jesus a Jew. He must therefore have looked like one, for the woman had no other guide. He was therefore unlike the current portraits of him, which nearly all give him an English aspect. Jesus did not, as most other Jews would have done under the circumstances, proceed to justify the Jewish objection to the claims of the Samaritans. He might justly have done so, but this would have been low ground. It belonged to a state of things which was nearly past and spent. The time had nearly come to give the work of God a wider extension, and Jesus was come expressly as the instrument of that extension. He therefore draws attention to himself. If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst ask of him, and he would have given thee living water. This was probably said in a tone of kindly dignity that would encourage the woman. She naturally did not see through the figure of his speech. She understood him literally. Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Whence then hast thou that living water? It then occurs to her that the stranger is perhaps claiming some especial gift in the case. She continues, during a momentary pause, which Jesus does not offer to occupy. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well? Though a Samaritan woman, she claims Jacob as father, after the manner of the Samaritans. Jesus does not disparage Jacob. He speaks of things as they are. It is the well that is in question. Whoever drinks of this will thirst again, but he that drinks of the water Jesus can give will never thirst. The water so given will be in him a perennial spring. Jesus was speaking in figure of the immortal life he should bestow, but the woman could not understand this. She supposes he is speaking of literal water, which by some medication or virtue would in one draught permanently satiate the thirst of the drinker. She would like to get a drink of such water, and so be saved the trouble of coming constantly to the well. She asks him to give her some of this water. The superhuman dialectical skill of Christ, so often manifested in collision with his foes, is here apparent in a delicate dilemma. The woman had taken him at his word, and in childlike simplicity asks him for the superior water he said he could give. To have said to the woman that she did not understand him, would simply have blocked her path. To have explained that he was speaking in figure would have embarrassed her understanding and assumed an inconvenient onus of exegesis. He therefore adroitly throws the subject into a channel suited to her capacity, and which relieves it of the necessity for explanation which he was not prepared to receive. He says, Go, call thy husband. The woman says, I have no husband. Jesus knew that she had no husband. Why, then, did he ask her to call him? To give him the opportunity of displaying a superhuman knowledge which the woman would herself recognize as an indication of his true character. The opportunity he instantly seizes. Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that sayest thou truly. The effect is instantly as Jesus anticipated and intended. The woman's attention is arrested 
as it could not have been by the most lucid explanations of the meaning of his figurative language. Sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. And here there must have been a pause, a brief pause, during which the woman's eyes wonderingly and inquiringly fixed on Christ, reflections would occur to her, filling up the apparent gap between the remark that he was a prophet and the allusion she proceeded to make to the long-standing controversy between the Samaritans and the Jews. She was evidently quick-witted and well-informed according to the standard of her day. Discerning the evidence of the power of God with this Jew, her mind opens to the possibility of the Jews being right in their objection to the Samaritan worship. She is, at all events, drawn toward the topic with a disposition to handle it inquiringly. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye, Jews, say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Again, Jesus avoids the discussion of the Samaritan issue in its narrow sense. He admits that the Samaritans worshipped ignorantly, and that enlightenment in this matter was with the Jews, to whom salvation appertained. But, knowing as he did, that the moment was at hand when worship of every kind would be suspended in the land by the judgment of God overhanging the nation, and when worship would be transferred by the gospel to individual hearts in all parts of the world, he addressed himself to the personal and practical bearing of the question. Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. The hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Here was an enlarging of the subject that must have been new and welcome to a Samaritan, though at the same time conveying a rebuke. Christ's words soared away from the question of locality, which was the vexed question between Samaritan and Jew. They obliterated it altogether. Neither in this mountain, Gerizim, nor yet at Jerusalem. Where, then? Anywhere and everywhere. Wherever there were true worshippers, people knowing God as revealed to Moses and the prophets, and to whom in their conscious hearts God was a reality, and who in their sincere and loving spirits adored him. The Father seeketh such to worship him, rather than the genuflecting formalist with whom the Samaritan woman would be familiar, and with whom worship was a matter of performance rather than of heart. That the Father should seek the worship of men and find pleasure in it is a great revelation on which we may constantly rest with consolation. But it is not this simple fact that Jesus presses on the woman's attention, so much as to point out the sort of worshippers who were acceptable, in contrast to the formalist multitude that then filled the land, both Judea and Samaria. Men of light and love would henceforth approach the Father acceptably everywhere, without having to come to a certain place to offer their worship. This must have been a pleasing view to a sincere woman such as she with whom Jesus was conversing. But a rebuke would be contained in the words, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. To the Samaritans, God was, well, as Jesus said, they knew not what. The ten tribes worshipped Jeroboam's calves at Dan and Bethel and Baal and other gods of the Canaanites besides. The people who were put in their place served their own gods, variously named Sakoth binoth Nurgle, Ashima, Nibhaz, Tartak, Adramalek, Anamalek, etc., mere idols of wood and stone. How much of this idol worship was retained by their descendants, the Samaritans, we have no means of knowing exactly, but the probability is that much of it remained, with the result of preventing them from having any idea of the true nature of God or acceptable worship. Jesus now rebukes the Samaritan idea, which led them to insist so strenuously on a particular place. It is as if he had said, God is not like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. God is not a man. He is not even as one of the imagined deities of the Greeks or Romans. He is spirit, 
immortal, invisible, the only wise God. We cannot go from his presence. He is everywhere present. He is an indivisible unit, filling heaven and earth, though having his personal nucleus in heaven. Nothing is hid from his sight. The thoughts of the heart are naked before him. Consequently, worship can be tendered to him at any place and at any moment. The essential thing is that it be true worship, the actual adoration of a man's spirit, the homage of felt sincerity and truth. The woman knew enough of Moses and the prophets to associate this enlarged knowledge with what the Messiah would do for them at his coming. I know that Messiah cometh, she said. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Now was the time for the top stone of the discourse. I that speak unto thee am he. After all that had passed, this declaration went home to the woman's conviction. She felt it must be so, and in the intensity of her feeling, the disciples having returned, she left further discourse, and leaving her water pot, went straight back to the city to divulge the great discovery. While she was away, the disciples brought of the food they had procured and asked Christ to eat. He was evidently too much absorbed with the incident that had just occurred, and with all the great ideas it would awake in his mind to do so. The proposal of his disciples was probably made in a callous, matter-of-fact way, entirely out of harmony with the spirit he was in. He answered in a way that seemed to rebuff their kindly ministrations. I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Probably, as in almost all cases among people today, the manner of the disciples would seem to unduly magnify the importance of the secular affairs in hand, or to convey a disparagement of those things that be of God. The disciples, in their unenlightened simplicity, took him up literally. They said among themselves, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? They probably supposed the woman whom they found him talking with had brought him something. He meets their surmisings in words that have probably done more than any other to create a right and adequate idea among disciples in every age of the kind and degree of earnestness with which the things of God should be held and followed. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. It was for the sake of their influence that the words were uttered and recorded. For your sakes is the explanation of much, nearly all that Christ said and did. I am glad for your sakes I was not there. For their sakes I sanctify myself. I have given you an example. These are illustrations of a fact that requires to be kept in view. Men who read the sayings of Christ without this fact in view will often mistake the assertions of lofty truth for petty self-vindication. When the woman arrived at Samaria, she said to her townsmen, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? By which she probably meant that the superhuman knowledge of her affairs displayed by Jesus was proof that he was what he had asserted himself to be. The Christ. They were not slow to respond to her words, and soon Christ had a large audience round the well. What he said to them is not recorded, but the favorable impression made upon the woman was evidently extended to them, and was strengthened by what they heard for themselves. For at the end of their interview, they pressed him to break his journey and stay with them a little. He yielded to their request and stayed with them two days. Their intercourse with him during that time led them finally to the conviction which they expressed before he left that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. It is probable that when a few years afterwards Samaria received the word of God at the hands of the apostles, Sycam would be among the places visited by Peter. If so, the recollections of the Sycamites, going back to this visit of Jesus himself, would be very striking and useful. Some have had a difficulty in reconciling Christ's action on this occasion with the direction he shortly afterwards gave to his disciples to go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any cities of the Samaritans enter ye not. There need be no difficulty. Christ did not visit the Samaritan district on this occasion in what we might call an official capacity. 
he was passing through it on his way to Galilee. What happened was in the way of a private incident and a personal condescension. It was a little before the time in a dispensational sense. If he forbade his disciples to include Samaria in the scope of their evangelistic labors, this was no reason why he should not, in the exercise of his prerogative as the master, himself, in passing, accept the hospitality of these privileged psychomites and speak to them of the great things of God. Chapter 15 From Jacob's Well to Capernaum via Cana and Nazareth Bidding farewell to the Samaritans of Sychem, Jesus, resuming his journey, passes from the shadow of Mount Gerizim into the open hill environed country to the north of that mount, traversing which, with his, at that time, very small band of disciples, he enters the gorge at the southern extremity of the Carmel Range, and emerges upon the plain of Isdralon, and shortly afterwards enters Galilee. He and his little company of fellow travelers would be seen by many an indifferent eye as they moved along the dusty, toilsome road northwards. Little would the casual onlooker in field and vineyard suspect the greatness of the ordinary-looking band of men that, for a moment, was visible on the road, and then disappeared as other passers-by. There would be nothing in their outward mien to distinguish them from the ordinary Jewish foot-passengers who traversed the land in great numbers about the time of the feasts to and from the holy city. Jesus had to be seen in the act of teaching before the difference between him and other men was apparent. And even then, at this stage of his work, he would but appear as an unusually grave, dignified, and earnest Jew. It required subsequent events to manifest the true greatness of him in whom, at first, Israel saw no beauty that they should desire him. Arrived at Galilee, Jesus made straight for Cana, where he had wrought his first miracle. He had not been long there when the news got abroad that he had returned from Jerusalem. The news reached Capernaum, where the son of an eminent citizen, styled a nobleman, and said to be one of Herod's officers, lay at the point of death. This man, hearing of it, went to Cana, where Jesus was, to ask Jesus to come and heal his son. Why should he suppose Jesus could do this? He must have heard of the miracles of healing he had performed at Jerusalem. He had probably made the acquaintance of Jesus during his first visit to Capernaum already referred to, and acquired some idea of who he was. He would doubtless be aware of John's ministry, on which he would probably be an attendant, and would not be ignorant of the testimony borne to Jesus as the Messiah. For some or all of these reasons, he had confidence in Christ's ability to disperse the shadow that lay on his house, for his son was at the point of death. He besought Jesus that he would come down and heal his son. But Jesus did not meet the nobleman's request with the ready and sympathetic compliance he showed on other occasions. He rather held the man off with something of a chiding manner. Except, said he, ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. There must have been a reason for this. Probably the nobleman's importunity was too much of the self-interested order, like the push of a crowd for some advantage. Possibly also there was an unacceptable element of challenge in it, as much as to say to Jesus that, if he were the Messiah, he was bound to do this. Likely also, with many others, he showed more interest in the signs than in the thing indicated by them. So Jesus uttered a reproof, which, however, did not check the natural ardor of the man. Sir, come down ere my child die. He expected Jesus would have to go down to Capernaum, it was literally a going down, for Capernaum lay on the margin of the Sea of Galilee in the Jordan Valley, while Cana was among the hills to the west. Perhaps Jesus would have gone down, as he did in other cases, had the man's attitude been such as to command his entire approval, but he did not do so. He granted his request without going. His power was greater than the nobleman knew. Go thy way, thy son liveth. 
The nobleman's faith in Christ was strong enough to place the most implicit faith in this brief word. He started at once for home, twenty miles off. His mind being at rest, he probably rested for the night at one of the wayside inns, for it was the next day when he reached the neighborhood of Capernaum. He was met outside the town by his servants, with the good but not surprising news that his son was all right. He asked them when the improvement began. They told him the hour. Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father recognized this as the very hour at which Jesus spoke the words of healing, and himself believed with his whole house. How could it be otherwise? Was ever such power seen on earth before? It was power superhuman that turned water into wine on the spot at Cana, and that cured the sick people brought to his presence at Jerusalem, of which the Galilean people had been witness. But here was healing performed at a distance of twenty miles, with the rapidity of lightning, simply by the utterance of a word. Peter afterwards spoke of miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. This is the all-sufficient and only explanation of the marvel. God alone has the command of the universal, invisible, inscrutable energy of creation, in which all things subsist, out of which they have been made by his contriving power and commanding word. To him, distance and locality are no impediment. The impulse of his will is equal to the instantaneous accomplishment of anything, anywhere. He places his power at the disposal of his servants, when his work and wisdom require, sometimes angels, sometimes men. To manifest his existence and power to Israel and the Egyptians, he placed his power in the angel that appeared to Moses, who exercised it at the prayer and signal of Moses by appointment. To establish Jesus as his name-bearer in the midst of Israel, he placed his power in him by his presence. Jesus, as the son of David, did not the works, as he said, The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. It was needful that the works he did should be such as should truly bear witness of him, that is, that they should be works beyond the range of human accomplishment. For had they been such as man, by any contrivance, could do, they would not have constituted the proof that was necessary. The way would have been open for men to think that Perhaps Jesus did them as a man of contrivance, and that, therefore, God was not with him. It was needful that the foundation of faith in him, as the Savior, should be laid in a manner admitting of no doubt. It was, therefore, necessary that he should do works beyond all human possibility. It is his doing of such works that leaves men no excuse for not believing in him. Jesus would have no fault to find with men for not believing in him if he had only done ordinary things. This is what he said. If I had not done among them works which none other man did, they had not had sin. That he did such works will be realized by all who give attention to them. There have been many pretenders of one kind or another, and they have done wonderful things in their way, healing and demon outcasting, and sign-working of a certain sort, Jesus admitted to be on the list of their accomplishments. But which of their achievements will compare with those of Jesus and his apostles, who with a word could even raise the dead at any distance? After remaining a short time at Cana, Jesus makes what would appear to be a farewell visit to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and where he was well known to all the townspeople, only as such could know him, that is, superficially, as a person with whose face and figure they were familiar, whose family and affairs they knew, but whose inner man they could no more know or fathom than they could plumb the dizzy depths of the universe. As the proclamation of the gospel was afterwards by his orders to begin at Jerusalem, so his own part in the work was to begin at Nazareth. As his custom was, He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. There was a good attendance. 
It was no strange or striking thing for them to see Jesus rise and read. They were to hear strange and striking things before they dispersed. They had heard strange and striking rumors about him and his doings at Cana, Jerusalem, and Capernaum, but the effect was only to fill them with disgust and envy at his presumption. They were offended at him. Their state of mind was indicated by the question, Is not this Jesus, whose father and mother we know? And are not his sisters here with us? True, O small-minded people of Nazareth, who have kindred in all the earth in every age. This was the Jesus of your acquaintance, but not of your knowledge. You did not and could not know him. You could know the color of his eyes, the shape of his face, the contour of his person, the sound of his voice. But you could not enter into his mind, or understand or sympathize with his loves and aims. You could but know the outside, and even this not accurately. His father and mother you knew, yet his father you did not know. For as Jesus afterward said, Had ye known me, ye would have known my father also. Ye thought that he, Jesus, was the mere son of Joseph, a mere Jew like yourselves. Ye knew not that he was the Word made flesh, the Son of the ever-living and only true God. And so, when he stood up to read in their synagogue, they were very little in the mood to receive what he had to say. People whose self-esteem is overshadowed and hurt are liable to be incapable of discerning greatness when it is before them. They were privileged to hear the Son of God read a portion from the prophet Isaiah, but it was no music in their ears to hear these words. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He would read this with an impressive deliberation and significant intonation. He read no more. He closed the book or roll and handed it back to the officiating rabbi and sat down with gravity and dignity. Doubtless, all eyes were now upon him. His manner, coupled with the rumors that were afloat, accentuated their attention. What would he say or do next? He spoke. His words were brief, but not ambiguous. This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. There could be no mistaking the meaning of this. It was plainly to say, I am he to whom Isaiah refers. Most of the audience saw this, and were for the moment impressed with his words, but their prejudiced feelings soon began to get the upper hand. Is not this Joseph's son? As much as to say, How can a man who is Joseph's son, whom we know, be the Christ, whose origin, when he comes, no man will know? For this was the tradition. A hum of skeptical conversation passed around, They began to suggest, Surely he will show us some miracles. Jesus anticipates and answers their line of thought. He will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do here in thy country. Well, what had he to say to this apparently unanswerable challenge? Only this, that the gift of God is not for all in this state of sin that he doeth as it pleaseth him, working all things after the counsel of his own will. But he does not put the fact in this naked form, which would have had no force with them. He does it by reference to the scripture history in which they trusted. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elijah sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, and unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. The inference arising from this citation was obvious enough to sting severely. A greater than Elijah or Elisha was before them, but it did not follow that the power of God which was with him would be put forth on their behalf. Israel's disobedience in the days of Elijah and Elisha had withheld from them the good that might have come. 
and the same cause might produce a like effect now. Why did Jesus adopt this austere attitude towards them? We are told that, as a matter of fact, Jesus could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief. Not that their unbelief disabled him for the performing of anything he might choose to do, but that their negative state put it out of the question that he should do works, which he never performed except good was to be done by it. No good is to be done with some people, and this was the case with the inhabitants of Nazareth, who had been too familiar with Jesus from his infancy to admit of their estimating him truly. It was an illustration of a rule that is almost universal. As Jesus told them, no prophet is accepted in his own country. The current mediocre mind is incapable of distinguishing between appearances and realities. The first, local, and limited impressions take shape as the permanent truth of a thing or person, and from this they never can emancipate themselves or open their minds to discern the true and actual worth of a man whom they have known from the beginning. On the other hand, this same class of mind, from a similar incompetence acting in another way, is easily impressed and even captivated by the pretensions of a stranger, who may be an empty windbag of pomposities or plausibilities. Loud-sounding humbug is liable to succeed in this shallow world, especially if bedecked with the meretricious attractions of title and fame. On this principle, false Christs have succeeded where the true was crucified. The true Christ was modest and glorified his Father. The faults were arrogant and self-assertive. Hence the popularity of Barcochibus, where Jesus was hated. As Jesus said beforehand, I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another come in his own name, him ye will receive. The words of Christ had the reverse of a soothing effect on the audience in the Nazareth synagogue. To soothe and please, you must put people on good terms with themselves. And to do this, you must flatter. That is, say undeserved good things to or of them. This was what Jesus did not, could not do. His words had an exasperating effect. The people, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. And their wrath was not noisy, harmless wrath. Noisy enough, very likely, but not harmless. With the excitability and impetuosity of the Jews, they rose up en masse and laid hold of Jesus and turned him out of the building and tumultuously led him to the edge of the steep hill on which Nazareth was built and which is to be seen, as travelers tell us, to this day. There, their purpose was to throw him down headlong and so destroy him but they strangely failed in their purpose. When they reached the spot, their resolution or their skill forsook them. Jesus, releasing himself from their hands, simply made his way through them, and no man felt able or disposed to stop him. They opened the way for him, and he went his way down the upper slope of the hill in the direction of Capernaum, twenty miles off, to which he repaired. The fact is, he was under a protection which, though invisible, was invincible. And through that protection, no man could break till permission was given. As it is written on another occasion, his hour was not yet come. And until that hour had come, he was under the shadow of Yahweh's hand, hid in which he was as safe in the midst of the threatening, surging multitude as in the solitude of the mountaintop to which he oft times resorted for prayer. In Capernaum, to which he now removed, Jesus was no stranger, and here he spent quite a considerable time before departing on the extensive journey which he afterwards undertook. His plan was to get at the public ear of Capernaum through the synagogues. This was easy for him to do. The synagogues were open to all Jews, but especially to a Jew of whom such strange reports were in circulation, and of whom such high expectations were beginning to be entertained by many. The Jews assembled in the synagogues for reading and exhortation out of the law and the prophets every Sabbath day, and Jesus availed himself of this opportunity, taking several synagogues by turn, Sabbath by Sabbath. Large audiences listened to him every Sabbath. They were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. 
the sense in which his word was with power is explained by the statement of Matthew that he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The scribes would be like our modern clergy, the mechanical rehearsers of dead formulas without the snap and ardor that come with intelligent conviction. Jesus taught with emphasis and fire, quiet and grave, but with the animation and pointedness of tone and gesture that result from certainty and knowledge. He likewise taught with a simplicity that enabled him to say much in little and to be easily understood. The common people, we are told, heard him gladly. They will never hear his like again till Christ send forth a host of similar teachers in the happy day of his kingdom. But it was his miracles that imparted the principles as to what he had to say. The people never knew what he might do. At every little interval, some great work of power would be performed, and that too of a kind that conferred benefit on the subjects of it. He had not been long in Capernaum when, on a certain Sabbath, in one of the synagogues in which he was discoursing, the quiet of the assembly was broken by the shout of a madman in the audience, Let us alone, said he, under the excitement produced in a disordered mind by the impressive words of Christ. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. We can imagine the momentary tumult that would be produced in the audience by this outburst. It was soon stopped by Christ. The man's madness is described as having been a spirit of an unclean demon. To this, the words of Christ were addressed, as distinguished from the helpless sufferer from the demanding disorder. Hold thy peace and come out of him. On this, the man leaped forward into the midst of the synagogue, and after a momentary paroxysm, in which the disordering spirit worked its way out of his organism, he was seen to be quite himself, cured of his madness. The people present were naturally amazed at such an exhibition of power. What a word is this, exclaimed they among themselves, for with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. The belief was almost universal in the days of Jesus, that mental malady of every kind was due to the presence of a demon, which had taken up its abode in the man, perverting his faculties. What a demon was, according to this belief, is only to be learnt from the writings of the pagans, Greek and Roman, but even these do not give us any clear conception, beyond this, that demons were invisible, intelligent, immaterial beings inhabiting the air and fulfilling a sort of mediatorial function between the gods and men, working in the latter the will of the former, for good or evil, but mostly evil. Of their origin, they have nothing beyond the suggestion that many of them were once men. The whole conception is, of course, a thoroughly heathenish one, and foreign to the scheme of things exhibited in Moses and the prophets. Jesus took no pains to confute the idea. His mission was to show the power of God, and not to demolish heathen theories of human woes. He took things as he found them, and spoke of popular things in the popular style without committing himself to popular views. Beelzebub was the prince of the demons, according to the popular thought, and by league with him it was supposed Jesus exercised the demonized. But there was no Beelzebub in reality. He was one of the imaginary gods of the Philistines. Yet Jesus argued as if Beelzebub was a reality, saying, if I by Beelzebub cast out demons, by whom do your children cast them out? So in the curing of madness in its various forms, he spoke as the people spoke, without meaning to endorse their foolish thought. In a sense, he could do so without impropriety. When a man is in a state of lunacy, there is literally an unclean spirit in him, that is, a diseased electric virus, the extraction of which restores him to soundness. It applies to other things besides madness. In various kinds of diseases, an evil spirit or influence exists, and he can be taken out and transferred from one to another. Cure by mesmeric application has made us familiar with this. I remember curing a person of an acute rheumatic pain which lodged itself in me the moment the person lost it and remained with me several days. 
Jesus brought all kinds of unclean spirits out of people by a word. He could, therefore, use the language of the time as in a rough way expressing a fact, without, however, meaning to sanction the heathenish idea in which it had its origin. In all cases, the afflicted were the speakers of the things imputed to the demons. It is a diseased man that is before us. The incidents and the utterances are all within the boundary line of a medical explanation. The one or two cases that may seem an exception to this we shall have under our notice as we proceed. In the case before us, a madman is in the audience. Madmen were to be met with frequently in those days. Not that madmen were more numerous than now, but that no system had been adopted of collecting and having them in asylums. They would be under private restraint here and there, but mild cases would be allowed at large, and easily might a harmless lunatic obtain admission to a synagogue where Christ was to be heard. Christ's preaching had a powerful effect upon his weak and deranged intellect, but the principal part of this effect would be due to the prevalent excitement caused by the report circulated everywhere that the Messiah had appeared. Of this excitement, a weak-minded man would have more than his share. The Messiah's appearance, it was well known, would not be an unmixed blessing. John the Baptist had declared that his fan was in his hand, and that he would thoroughly purge his floor, and burn up the chaff with fire unquenchable. There would, therefore, be a strong ingredient of apprehension in the public anticipation that existed. A sense as of impending judgment would rest on many. This explains the madman's ejaculations. He went with many others to hear one who was said to be the Messiah. He listened to him in a crowded and heated synagogue. He instinctively felt, as he listened, to one who spake as one having authority, that this was indeed the Christ. His fear grew to excitement. His ungovernable feelings boiled over. It was the natural language of such a state of mind for him, speaking as one of the audience, to say, Leave us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Chapter 16 From Capernaum to the Scene of the Sermon on the Mount It was inevitable that the cure of the demented man in the presence of a crowded congregation in one of the synagogues of Capernaum should make a deep impression. The congregation dispersing would carry the tidings far and wide. The fame of him went out into every place of the country round about. The result was soon seen in the crowd that gathered. All they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. None were sent away uncured. There was no form of disease that Jesus could not handle. He was not like the race of empirics or quacks who have partial success in a few cases of superficial ailments and nothing but failures and pretentious apologies for serious maladies nor was he like pretenders to miraculous power who affect concealments and impose conditions and do nothing but what is in the power of any man ordinarily endowed with the vis mediatrix of nature. Jesus restored sight to the blind as easily as he banished a fever or removed a palsy. He raised the dead with no greater effort and as much success as he made the lepers whole. His achievements were beyond the power of nature as known to man. The secret lay in the power employed. The power of the Lord was present to heal. The Lord of nature can do anything with nature. All nature is in him and subject to his control. His spirit embraces and sustains it all, and his will is omnipotent in the manipulation of all its forces. Disease is due to the absence of organic power. Supply this, and cure is the necessary result. But who but he can supply it? The medical art consists in helping nature to supply it by the application of artificial stimuli, but it can do nothing where nature is too far gone to be acted upon. The power of God can supply the absent tone or the absent power of nature to generate it. It was by the application of this power 
that Jesus was enabled to heal all manner of disease among the people. No other power in heaven or earth was equal to it. The power of magicians, soothsayers, astrologers, familiar spirits, etc., was merely natural power employed with the pretense that it was divine power. It was natural power drawn either from themselves in the shape of animal magnetism or from nature in the unknown form of mechanical electricity. It could accomplish things that seemed divine to the ignorant, but which were nevertheless strictly within the limits of natural power and not due to divine volition at all. Their offensiveness to God lay in claiming His power and authority on the strength of natural gift. The works of Christ were all beyond what man could accomplish by any power within natural control. They were by the finger of God. The blasphemy of the Pharisees consisted in their attributing them to Beelzebub. Amongst the cures effected, we have the casting out of demons from many besides the man in the synagogue. It is unfortunate they should be called devils, because this diverts attention from their real nature. The word is not diaboli, but daimonia. Devil is a divine conception, whereas demon is a pagan thought. Devil defines the real nature of sin and sinners from a divine point of view, as expressing the idea of false opposition. But demon is the invention of the heathen mind, giving body to the idea barbarians had formed of the cause of mental aberration. By preserving the difference in the terms employed, the difference of the things is kept in view. In the revised version of the New Testament, demons is supplied in the margin. It ought to have appeared in the text, and devils discarded altogether. It would have been so if the American revisers had had their way. Presumably, the English revisers thought the adoption of demons would have raised a dangerous, and in their thought, a needless controversy. With Miltonic predispositions, they recognized in the New Testament demons the associates of Satan. Believing in the personal devil of popular theology, they naturally considered it immaterial whether his angels were called devils or demons. From their point of view, the retention of devils is intelligible enough, but... It is, nonetheless, a corruption in the translation which serves to conceal the true idea of the original. Devils came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. This reads entirely in harmony with the Greek idea. It could not have been otherwise expressed to be intelligible from the point of view of the first-century spectator, but it is not out of harmony with the fact that what is recorded is the simple curing of demented people, that which the Greek pagans called demons, and which, through the prevalence of the Greek language and Greek philosophy, was universally spoken of as demons, came out. There was a real coming out. The deranging and obstructing influence the real physical virus that impeded and confused the action of the brain came out, as indicated in the last chapter, so that, in that sense, the language is literally accurate. But the thing that came out was not the Greek demon, but the demon of the disease. The crying out was, of course, the act of the persons deranged. The words came out of their throats. It was not sound emitted by the impalpable influence expelled from them, but sounds formed by the laryngeal apparatus of the persons acted on by Christ. In the same way, the statement that they knew that he was Christ is affirmable of the persons possessed, and not of the abstract influence possessing them. He suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. The influence could not speak, the deranged persons could. Therefore it was the mouths of the mad men and women that were stopped, not of the imaginary intelligences which the Greeks taught possessed mad people. Yet their utterances were due to the madness. Therefore, those utterances could justly enough be accredited to the influence causing the madness, as when it is said of a drunken man, it is the drink that is speaking. People out of their minds and wandering at large in a country where there were no lunatic asylums would naturally catch up the prevalent excitement about Christ and rave about it. 
Jesus did not permit even his disciples to speak of his messiahship, for reasons we may afterwards see. Therefore, it is no wonder he put a gag on the excited lunatics that were brought into his presence for healing. During his stay in Capernaum, if not indeed immediately on his arrival in the neighborhood, walking one day by the inland sea on which Capernaum stands, Jesus saw Peter and Andrew busy in a boat. They were fishermen. He had seen them before. They had, in fact, accompanied him from the place of the Baptist labors on the banks of the Jordan, and on his journey through Samaria into Galilee, and had become believers in his messiahship under the circumstances already narrated, and in that sense, disciples or learners. But Jesus had not till now invited them to close association in his own work. They were now prepared to receive such an invitation. All that had gone before had thoroughly persuaded them that Jesus was the Christ. Hearing him, therefore, now say to them from the shore, As they were in the act of casting a net for the catching of fish, for they were fishermen, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. It was natural that they should, without hesitation, comply with his command. Their action was not so abrupt as it seems, when, Straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. A little way further on, he saw James and John engaged in the same way with their father Zebedee. They also had been the subjects of a like preparation. To them also he addressed the like brief but pregnant words of call and received a like prompt response, for they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. Thenceforward, they accompanied him wherever he went, till the day when he ascended to heaven out of their sight on the summit of the Mount of Olives. The object of the works of cure wrought by Christ was not exclusively philanthropic. In fact, it was so only in secondary degree. The main purpose was to show the power of God in Christ as the foundation and proof of his claim upon the obedience of men as the Lord's anointed. There were multitudes of diseased people whom he could have cured with a word, as easily as the nobleman's son at twenty or thirty miles distance, and yet who remained unbenefited. Had his object merely been doing good in the sense understood by modern philanthropy, he would have swept the land by his healing power and left not a soul attaint with evil. Instead of that, his power was put forth only in connection with cases brought under his immediate notice. It is important to have this limitation and its meaning in view. He worked for God first, man next, when subject to God, which explains a good deal in connection with his work that might otherwise be hard to understand, such as his austere bearing toward the multitude on many occasions, his disparagement of human claims and affinities, his discouragement of popular applause, his depreciation of the desire on the part of the people to see signs and wonders, etc. Sometimes his power was put forth with private benefit, though serving the purpose of his miracles. Thus we find him curing Peter's mother-in-law, whom, on entering Peter's house at Capernaum, he found taken with a great fever. Those around her Seeing the miracles of healing Jesus was performing among the multitudes on the street, had besought him on her behalf. He stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she arose and ministered unto them. From an invalid requiring to be waited on, she became the hale and hearty housekeeper waiting on all. When Capernaum became crowded with the people drawn by his miracles, he wanted to get away from them. He did not appreciate the importunate attention of which he was the object. It was not the sort he cared for. It was the eager and hustling self-assertion to be seen in any crowd when there is any good to be got by a scramble. He could not get away from it in the daytime without being seen and followed and his object frustrated. He therefore rose up a great while before day and went out and departed to a solitary place. We follow him in spirit through the clear, bracing morning air, and watch him tread his solitary way along the mountain footpath till he reaches a secluded spot. What do we see him do there? 
he there prayed. There is no need for awe-struck hand upliftings and transcendental exclamations at this spectacle. It is the most natural in the world. A mind open to God naturally gravitates to him at every such suitable opportunity. The mind, realizing that God is not far from every one of us, that every point of space is in touch with the universal energy of his presence, through which all occurrences are as quickly, more quickly, signaled to the Father's notice than the movements of the needle through the wire of man's invention, or the vibrations of sound through the telephone to the ear of a listening friend at a distance, a mind enlightened towards God and reconciled to him, and realizing this great and glorious fact, naturally turns to God with every opportunity of leisure and hour of need. If this is true of ordinary men instructed in godliness, how much more true of Christ, who was in perfect harmony with the Father, where we can only attain to partial harmony. He had been for some days in contact with the carnally-minded crowd, with spirit jaded and thirsting as in a dry land for the great and glorious Father of wisdom, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, he seizes this favorable opportunity of refreshing and strength by retiring to the lone mountainside and opening his heart to him who, afar off, can see and understand the inmost motions of the human spirit upon earth. In this, we have both an example for the brethren of Christ to follow and an illustration of what must be every righteous man's experience. It is a necessity in an evil world like this for the friend of God to occasionally get away from the depressing and demoralizing influences at work everywhere. A man can never see things as they are without a good share of solitude and the unhampered communion with God which solitude admits of. In human company, unless the godliest, human views and thoughts inevitably press themselves upon us. We do not see things as they are, but as they appear. We are pressed with the views of the moment, of the locality, of the personal exigencies of the hour, all mere elements of the picture as transient as the gold-tip clouds of evening. We want to see God and his eternal purpose and human thought and action as related to these. And to do this, we require to get away much and to pray much. Christ's solitude was not long undisturbed. The disciples, early astir, discovered that Christ's couch was empty and that he was nowhere about. The crowds temporarily accommodated in Capernaum, also began to move about at an early hour and to make inquiries for Christ. The tidings passed round, He is gone! There was a great stir and much application to the disciples. The disciples could give no information. At last they resolved to try and find him. They suspected he had retired for quietness to the mountains, and they went there in search of him under Peter's leadership, and probably at his suggestion. By and by they find him. They feel they have done a thing to be apologized for in breaking into his privacy. So they say, All men seek for thee, as much as to say, We would not have come if it had merely been ourselves. They evidently expected he would go back with them. But no. Let us go into the next towns. He wanted to be passing on. Capernaum was merely a part of his work. He must visit other places, that I may preach there also. Therefore came I forth. Preaching the truth was his work. The working of miracles was merely to strengthen that work. It was therefore secondary. But with the people it was first. Many liked the miracles, who did not care for the preaching. It is so in the different circumstances of our time. Plenty of people like the people and the circumstances associated with the truth, but care little for the truth itself, which is a grief of mind to every true friend of Christ. Christ and the disciples had not made a start to go into the next towns when the people themselves began to arrive from Capernaum. News had got abroad that Christ was found, and they streamed out to him. On arriving, they discovered that Jesus was meditating departure, and they implored him to remain. They stayed him that he should not depart from them. But Jesus did not comply with their wishes. He said unto them, 
I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. The people would judge from his manner that it was no use pressing him. So, after hanging about till Jesus and his disciples had taken their departure, they dispersed. They were, however, to see him back again several times. Jesus then proceeded to make a circuit of the towns and villages of Galilee, working on the plan commenced in Capernaum. That is, beginning at the synagogues on the Sabbath, and having secured the attention of the people, teaching and working among them in detail as occasion offered. He could not at this time secure the comparative privacy of his initial efforts. There followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis, and even from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan, that is, from the land of Gilead. It was no wonder. It was, in fact, inevitable. It is what would happen again. Who could withhold the populace from the steps of a teacher, not only speaking as men never spake, but dispensing with a word those bounties of blessing which all men most appreciate? It was during this tour that some of the most notable incidents recorded by the evangelists occurred. The Sermon on the Mount, as it is called, belongs to this stage of his movements. Jesus delivered multitudes of addresses of which we have no record. John, by a hyperbole, tells us that the world itself would not contain the books that would be written if every word were recorded. It must have been so. The sayings of three years and a half must have been voluminous if all had been recorded, unprofitably so, for such a cumbrous writing would have failed as a means of general enlightenment. What was proposed was not a report in the modern newspaper sense, or even a biography as the nineteenth century understands. The object was to make such a selection out of the materials of three years and a half as should exhibit a picture of the whole, sufficiently complete for the purpose in view. The doing of this with such conciseness and perspicuity and grace as is done in the gospel narratives is itself evidence that it is a work of God, and not of, though by, man, for man never writes with this gift. The variations in these narratives, at which the undiscerning stumble, are not at all inconsistent with the fact that they are the work of the Spirit of God. We must consider that the same things would be said many times in the life of Christ, and with these variations in the form of expressing them, in which intelligence always delights to indulge. Only crystallized mediocrity repeats itself. Out of all these variations, the Holy Spirit makes its own selections in writing an abridged account of them by four men, used in harmony with the four-square organization of the Commonwealth of Israel, that in the mouths of several witnesses the matter might be established in accommodation to human infirmity. It gives the substance and rarely the ipsissima verba of the conversations occurring, and, where a conversation as reported by one historian differs from that by another, it is not that either are wrong, but that both versions of it occurred in the conversation. The Holy Spirit was the speaker of the words by Christ, and in writing an account of the work, the Holy Spirit, by the apostles, could and did use that freedom of paraphrase which any author does in reporting his own sayings and opinions, a principle that also explains the verbal variations of the Holy Spirit in quoting itself in the New Testament from the Old. The Sermon on the Mount, reported by Matthew, was an earlier utterance than that recorded by Luke, and spoken in a different place, which accounts for the difference between the one and the other, on which unbelief lays such stress, and also for the circumstance that, while Matthew says Jesus went up into a mountain to speak on the occasion, Luke says he came down and stood in the plain. A superficial resemblance has led unbelievers to the conclusion that they are an identical speech, differently reported by two untrustworthy historians. It has not occurred to them, or at all events they have not recognized, that in speaking in so many different localities, Jesus would sometimes say in one place things somewhat resembling what he had said in another. It is difficult for people living, as we do, so long after the work of Christ, and in an age when his words are familiar as household words, 
to adequately estimate the extraordinary character and bold originality of this Sermon on the Mount. We require to go back to the day of its delivery and to take our stand among the multitude that heard it, taking with us, too, a little more intelligence and discrimination than the multitude would possess, knowing something of the ways and principles of men as exemplified in the history and literature of Greece and Rome, perhaps also of Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, and Persia before them. With this acquaintance with the moral barrenness, the ethical harshnesses, and the intellectual frivolity of mankind, we should be prepared to listen with the right appreciation and to share in the general astonishment with which the teaching of Christ was received. Seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. The people had come from all parts, as we have seen, and were too numerous to be addressed successfully on the level ground. He therefore sought the elevation of a hillside, on which he selected a convenient spot. And when he was set, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. It is evident from this that what he said was addressed to his disciples, not the twelve, who were not yet appointed, but to all who believed in him, who at this time were a large number. They would form the inner ring of the numerous assemblage convened before him. Outside would be the common populace, embracing sightseers and hangers-on of all sorts. The scene stands out like a brightly colored picture, the clear, deep blue of the Syrian sky overhead, in the background a hillside, brown and furs clad, Jesus, the central figure, seated on a convenient terrace a little way above the level, gathered thickly around him, and seated in all postures and clad in garments of every bright blue, like the Orientals of today, the company of admiring disciples, while outside of them, on all sides, posted on the hill above and behind, and standing in a mass below, the common crowd. The word would pass round that Jesus was about to speak, and silence would be made. After a few minutes of attentive expectation, a clear, strong voice of musical timbre would break upon the air, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed! The very first word was something new, comfortingly new in an age when the chilling philosophy of Greece and Rome held the mind of the world in blight and check, not new in Israel, but new in the foreign national life that had come in like a flood and had for several centuries submerged even the glories of Moses and the prophets. There was kindness and hope in the word blessed. Blessed in the sense of being happy in the possession of God's favor and assured good to come. The word was like dew on the arid ground, like daybreak on the gloomy night. And for whom did Jesus with musical voice pronounce this blessedness? Not for the rich and the great and the powerful and the learned, but for a class hitherto beneath recognition or consideration, the poor in spirit, they that mourn, the meek, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. This is the sort that were not only left out of account, but that were avoided, as at this day, because of their sorrow, their dullness, their lowness. Men seek the prosperous, the high-spirited, the gay, who are not burdened with regrets or scruples of any kind. Blessedness is associated, in human thought, with the very opposite class to those on whom Jesus pronounced his benediction, the proud-spirited, the independent, the stoical, the gay, the happy-go-lucky, who taste life's glad moments with eyes avert from darkness, the manly, the plucky, the self-defenders, those who trouble not their heads about impracticable questions of religion and morality, but take things rough, ready, and jolly in a rough and ready world. Such would be pronounced blessed by the wisdom of this world, but the wisdom of the world is not wisdom truly, but folly. It is a philosophy based upon a transient view of things, and therefore, 
false, and fatal in its results. No man is wise who looks at a matter partially. It must be seen all round and in all its issues before a just estimate can be formed. Worldly philosophy may work well for a while, but only for a little while. Time is against it and washes it away at last with a dark and angry flood. Christ is the wisdom of God. His voice, heard amid the mountains of Syria 1850 years ago, and preserved in wonderful writing to our late and passing day, was the voice of wisdom, and its benediction will be realized by the class on whom they were bestowed, the believers in him who have in all ages mainly consisted of the afflicted and the sorrowful. Christ gives the reason, and as we listen, it shines out in as strong a light as the fact of the blessedness. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They shall be comforted. They shall inherit the earth. They shall be filled. We look in vain to human philosophy for assurance of this kind. Such great and precious promises cannot come from man. There is no promise in human directions. Speculation enough you may have, opinion, theory, principle, etc. But a pledge of good to come, who can give this but God alone? Some turn to nature. But apart from God, nature mocks knowledge and hope of futurity. Who can receive information from the forests, the mountains, the rocks, the oceans, the vast overarching heavens, or the countless stars that revolve in space? They are silent on the hope of man, irresponsive, mechanical, remorseless, reflecting a wisdom they cannot teach, and a purpose they cannot utter. Only God can promise, and by the mouth of Christ he has done it, confirming the promise by many infallible proofs of its divinity and truth. Ye poor and mournful, ye meek and hungry, of God's enlightened and obedient family, who to the world are of no account, take courage and look forward with joy. For God has declared his regard for you by the mouth of his beloved Son, and has promised you such good things as it has not entered into the heart of the natural man to conceive. The kingdom of heaven is yours, the kingdom that is coming from heaven in contradistinction to that which now prevails upon the earth, the former, the kingdom of God. This the kingdom of men. It has long been promised by the God of heaven that he will supplant and destroy this latter by setting up his own glorious kingdom in all the earth. When this kingdom comes, it will be yours to reign therein, to ride upon the high places thereof, to luxuriate in the glory, honor, wealth, and gladness thereof, rejoicing most of all in the blessedness of which you will be medium for all families of the earth. Then indeed ye shall know what it is to be comforted, to inherit the earth, to be filled. Chapter 17 The Sermon on the Mount The last chapter introduced this subject, the blessedness pronounced on the poor in spirit, the mournful, the meek, and those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, is also proclaimed by Jesus on behalf of the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, and the persecuted, implying characteristics of kin with those already noted. It was something new to extol such qualities, and their glorification by Christ has done much to disseminate them, even in the present chaotic phase of the work of God upon the earth. The manners and practices of civilized mankind are much milder and more humane since these words of Christ were uttered and recorded. The sentiment of mercy was comparatively unknown in the times of Greek and Roman paganism. Purity, peace, and submission to maltreatment have been practiced only where Christ's doctrine has been influential. The eulogy of them and the declaration of a blessing on those who practice them implies that, without them, salvation will not be attained. And this is indeed what is taught expressly in other parts of the apostolic writings, such as, He shall have judgment without mercy that hath shown no mercy. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. 
Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. But if the eulogy of mercy, purity, and peace distinguished Jesus from all who went before him, how much more was he marked off as a new and revolutionary teacher by his command to resist not evil, to love those who hate, and submit to the compulsions of evil men, yea, even go beyond their desires in our compliances. Such precepts were opposed to the radical impulses of flesh and blood. The injunction of them is one of the strongest proofs of what Christ asserted when he said to the Pharisees, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. He that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things that I heard of him. Had Jesus been a natural thinker, he would have taught in harmony with nature's impressions and instincts, as do the philosophers, so called, of every age and country. He would, therefore, have inculcated self defense. He would have glorified the virtues of patriotism, as appreciated and applauded by flesh and blood everywhere. He would have scouted principles and practices which, apart from their special objects, are pusillanimous, cowardly, and contemptible. But he did none of these. He deprecated the class of character in highest repute among the Greeks and Romans, and Britons too, and enjoined that which is, with them, convertible with poltroonery. And he did so not as the result of a moral philosophy he had embraced or conceived. He did not enjoin the maxim of non-resistance on the ground of its tendency to conciliate a foe or develop control. It was simply a matter of command resting on authority. These things I command you. And the authority of the command rested with the Father. The Father who sent me, he gave me a commandment what I should say. And the commandment simply called for obedience and left no room for anything else. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. When ye have done all, say, Behold, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which it was our duty to do. In this, we learn the object of the command, the performance of duty. And on this hangs the question of acceptance. He that doeth the will of my Father shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. He that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, shall be likened unto a man that built his house upon a rock. When this is apprehended, all mystery and difficulty vanish from the Sermon on the Mount. The commandments it contains were not uttered as moral maxims best fitted for the regulation of the world, but for the test of obedience, and for the restraint and discipline of the natural man in those who are called to share and reflect the glory of God in a future state of existence on the earth by resurrection. Their inconvenience and their hardness, instead of being enigmatical, becomes transparent in the wisdom of their adaptation to the object in view. How is a man tested but by a difficult feat? How is he trained but by difficult exercises? When God would prove Abraham, did he ask him to make a feast for his servants? No. He asked him to offer up his only son Isaac, whom he loved. When God would prove men in advance for the unspeakable exaltation of his kingdom, should it be by exercises that leave pride and willfulness untouched, or by those which test obedience to the utmost, and give opportunity for that humbling of ourselves as little children, without which Jesus said we should in no case enter into the kingdom. Reason cannot falter in the answer, and the answer justifies to the utmost those very features in the Sermon on the Mount which are stumbling blocks to the wise of this world. It is all a question of faith in the declared purpose of God. Will God set up a kingdom? Is Jesus the appointed king? Has Jesus called for associates from among the world? Does he, in the choosing of them, adopt a process of purifying them unto himself a peculiar people? When a man is sufficiently enlightened to give a bold yes in answer to these questions, he will have no difficulty in recognizing the perfection of wisdom in those commandments in the Sermon on the Mount, 
which, with nearly all men, are impossible rules of life, but which, with Christ in view, become habitual principles of action. The superhuman character of the discourse is manifest from other features. Who, for example, as a matter of mere moral philosophy, would have thought of addressing disciples as the salt of the earth and the light of the world? Mere moral philosophy, that is, the speculations of mortal flesh as to the ways of God, places all men on a level in the operation of its laws and principles. But here is a declaration which assumes that all men outside the narrow circle addressed are in corruption and darkness. This, indeed, is the express teaching of the Spirit of Christ elsewhere, that without Him there is no hope, that the way is narrow and the gate straight that leads to life, and the finders of the way few. It is this exclusive claim that is at once the stumbling block of the naturally minded and the evidence of the divinity of the work of Christ. It is not in man to put forth such claims, except in madness, and even when occasionally put forth by madmen, it is the aberrated refraction of Christ in a distempered mind. It is not original, as in the case of Christ, nor has it the dignity and self-evident truth that it has in the case of Christ. There are not in any case the proofs that there are in the case of Christ. No man can maintain that Christ was mad in view of his teaching, his miracles, and his resurrection. Not being mad, such claims are in themselves evidence of the truth of what he has said, that God was in him, and that God sent him, and that his words were the words of God. His disciples, that is, those who fully receive and faithfully re-echo his teaching, which is the truth as nothing else is, are the light of the world, insofar as they reflect his light. For, primarily, it is he who is the light of the world, as he said. And away from the truth, all is the darkness of nature. Jesus, therefore, commands them to let their light shine that men may see it. Hence it is their duty to let it be manifest to those among whom they are situated, that they are children of the light, believers, lovers, and performers of the truth. This is done when the hope is professed according to the seasonable opportunity, and its invitation pressed upon attention, and its power shown in the effect it has upon action. This attitude is intensely odious to those who are not disciples of Christ. It is the attitude of obedience and wisdom for all that, and will be acknowledged and rewarded openly, at a time when the mightiest of natural men will be glad to stoop at the feet of the meanest of Christ's accepted disciples. Jesus supplies the key to his mission in the next statement. People were supposing that he had come to set up a new religion, disjoined from all that God had done and said to Israel by Moses and the prophets. He gives the death blow to this misconception in the words, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. The Christ of the New Testament, as distinguished from Christ of modern theology and philosophy, is Christ, the fulfillment of Moses and the prophets. This puts the Old Testament in its right place and brings to bear the true light in which Jesus is to be regarded. If we cannot understand Jesus in harmony with Moses and the prophets, we have not got hold of the scriptural Jesus, but another Jesus than that preached by the apostles. This is indeed the position of the professing Christian world. They hold and promulgate a conception of Jesus, which either compels them to put aside Moses and the prophets, or at least renders that preponderating section of the Holy Scriptures utterly useless to them. Hence, all classes of so-called Christians deal very loosely with the Old Testament Scriptures, and in many cases surrender them altogether. Jesus declares that not one jot or one tittle of them should remain unfulfilled. It was his mission to fulfill them, and to fulfill them all. He has already done much in their fulfillment. In what he has done, he laid the basis of a complete fulfillment. The complete fulfillment awaits his second coming, when, 
as he afterwards caused to be proclaimed by John and Patmos to all his disciples throughout the ages, the mystery of God shall be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. He next exhibits an aspect of his teaching, which is exactly nullified by the evangelical and other preachings of the day. Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only believe is the cry of preachers of all kinds. It is an easy, pleasant doctrine, but false. Believing on Christ will commend us to God, but it will not secure salvation unless it is accompanied by obedience of what God by Christ commands. Jesus says so in this very discourse. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. The will of the Father is expressed in the commandments of the Son, and the righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees is the righteousness that consists of doing those commandments. The seed of the woman are defined as those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. As Jesus says, Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. It is in view of this that the commandments in the Sermon on the Mount become so important. He proceeds to rehearse them. The chief of them we have already glanced at. He goes on to prohibit unjust anger, contemptuous epithets, the nursing of wrath, lustful contemplations, swearing, the resistance of encroachment, the refusal of alms. He enjoins merciful liberality, the returning of good for evil, anonymousness of almsgiving, secrecy and brevity of prayer, the cheerful and unmurmuring endurance of affliction, abstinence from hoarding, in connection with which he makes the pointed declaration, he cannot serve God and mammon. He deprecates anxiety as to livelihood, positively forbidding the questions, what shall we eat? What shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? After all these things, says he, the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of those things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. He condemns the hypercriticism that hunts after blemishes in a neighbor's character, forbids the judgment, which is his prerogative alone, as Paul says, Judge nothing before the time, until the Lord come, who will make manifest the hidden things of darkness. He recommends care in the exhibition of holy things, boldness in prayer, and a sympathetic regard for our neighbor's point of view in all transactions, doing unto him as we would that he should do unto us. Reminding disciples of the difficulty of being saved, he warns them against false prophets, who always teach an easy way for the pleasing of men. He tells them that such are to be discerned by their anti-scriptural characteristics. He assures them that a nominal or theoretical acknowledgement of his lordship will be of no value to any man at last, that only those are acceptable who do what he has required, and that many at last will claim his favor on the score of preaching and prophesying and even miracle-working, whom he will reject, as in reality workers of iniquity. He concludes with the well-known house-building illustration, the folly of admiring his teaching without acting it out. The house built on the sand comes down on the day of the flood. Of the immense audience who listened to him, we are told they were astounded at his doctrine, not so much at the matter as the manner for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The scribes were uncertain, timid, and formal. Jesus was earnest, clear, unhesitating, authoritative. The scribes feared and taught by a human standard, the tradition of the elders. They taught thus, not as a matter of individual conviction, but as the accepted rule with which it was convenient to comply. Jesus taught with the emphasis of knowledge, divinely derived, and with the ardor of a pure love and the clearness and dignity of a noble purpose. 
Jesus knew what he was about. The others did not. Solomon says, Knowledge causeth a man's face to shine. There is a great difference between imitators and men that speak from the heart, between such as aim to please men and those who seek to please God, between conventional garnishers of accepted principles and those who draw truth as living water from the hidden primeval rocks. Such was the difference between Jesus and the scribes, a difference which the people could see in his manner. The situation is somewhat reversed now. It is in writing and not in speaking that we have to make the acquaintance of the words of Christ by reading, not by hearing. It is the matter rather than the manner by which we have to judge, and a right judgment on this head will engender the same astonishment that the listener felt at his manner. The matter is truly sublime. The difficulty of estimating it aright arises from familiarity. The Sermon on the Mount has been so long before the world as to have become an obsolete and worn-out form of speech with the fastidious Athenians, whose taste is always itching for a new sensation. It requires an effort of the understanding, an effort which repetition will reward with success, to disentangle it from the smothering associations of modern life and go back and see it as it appeared when it came from his lips on the picturesque day in the open air on the mountainside. It came forth then as a constellation of electric brightness against the dark sky of human sterility and insignificance, and it shines still with glory undiminished for the eyes of those who can see it. The smoke of a bonfire will hide the stars from the people heaping on the faggots, but the stars shine all the same, and reveal their stupendous form and splendor to a telescope in the next street. The people are all engaged in bonfires of one kind and another, and they cannot see the glory of the Sermon on the Mount for the smoke they make. But it is all there for those who will apply the instruments of spiritual eyesight. Here is no uncertain human philosophy, bewildering with its cloudy vagueness and fatiguing the mind with futile abstractions. Here we have an authoritative rule of life, simple as the alphabet and reliable as the guidance of the pole star to ships at sea, a straight, definite, dogmatic enunciation of duty in the practical relations of this mortal life, authoritative because divine, and bringing with it the most beautifying moral results, whether as character seen by the observer or mental state as experienced by the man who obeys. Its excellency will be seen in the beautiful results, necessarily developed where it is accepted and practiced as the rule of life, especially when these results are compared with the moral and intellectual stolidity of Greek and Roman paganism. What, for example, can exceed the beauty or the comfort of the anticipation of ineffable good created in the mind of the believer by the assurance of blessedness as the upshot of a course of mercy meekness, purity, and righteousness, pursued even in sorrow or persecution? What can induce a greater sense of circumspection than the information that Christ regards us as the light of the world and the salt of the earth? What can tend more powerfully to elevate and purify the character than the intimation that righteousness only will secure an entrance into the kingdom of God? What can more powerfully modify the harshness or mollify the asperity of the natural character than the declaration that even anger is sin and the use of terms of personal reproach and offense endangering salvation? What more conducive to chastity than the reprobation of impurity, even in thought? Consider also the chasteness of speech engendered by the command to swear not at all, the gentleness of character calculated to result from the command to resist not evil, the kindness and urbanity necessarily springing from the effort to give in to importunities, even of unreason, and even to return benefits for the harm done by those who hate us, the modesty and genuineness certain to result from the enjoined habit of doing good, unseen and unknown, and praying in secret. How noble also the recommended cheerfulness that endures grief without parading it, and the industry that is busy without avarice, and the stewardship 
that is faithful without anxiety. Such a model of perfect character was never conceived before the days of Christ. Virtue had been philosophically lauded, but the thing meant by that term was a nebulous abstraction, or else a quality attaching to only one or two limited excellencies. The virtue of pagan morality was as unlike the new man outlined in the precepts of Christ as the works of man are unlike the works of nature. If there was courage in it, there was no compassion. If there was hardihood, there was no tenderness. If there was endurance, there was none of the patience that puts up with evil that can be dispensed with. If there was valor or friendship, there was none of the magnanimity that can pass over an injury or benefit a foe. Ambition, and not the love of God, was the ruling motive. To get gain, and not to do duty, was the recognized policy. To vanquish foes, and not to relieve the afflicted, was the crowning glory. Truth was always held in subservience to interest. There have been disparagements of the Sermon on the Mount that are not consistent with it as a whole. Cynical criticism has seized on isolated features and exaggerated them to the exclusion or eclipse of other parts which give them symmetry of beauty. Enlarging on the pronounced blessedness of the poor in spirit or on the obligation to resist not evil or on the command to take no thought for tomorrow, enmity has sought to represent the whole discourse as an emasculating and contemptible rule of life. Such tactics are very old and will only be successful with those whose predispositions are in harmony with them. They cannot prevail with those who exercise moral discernment on the word of Christ themselves. Such discernment perceives a counterpoise operating in all parts of the discourse with the result of preventing any of the moral imperfections that would spring from an isolated precept acting by itself. A perfect equilibrium comes from the action of the whole, and it was never intended that any part should be left out. A man of meekness, resisting not evil, and taking no thought for the moral, will not degenerate into effeminacy and sloth when he is called upon also to let his light shine before men, to exceed the Pharisees in righteous deeds, to be prompt in seeking reconciliation with the offended, to do good to those who hate him, and at the same time to have a quick eye for spiritual imposture. All this would indicate and foster an executiveness of character quite equal to that required in the affairs of the children of this world. Only it would be executiveness tempered and mollified by the law that makes gentleness and non-resentfulness a matter of obligation. The sinners have the vigor and executiveness without the oil of moral repression. Consequently, there is an undercurrent of harshness in their moral composition which is ready to flame into anger and destructiveness against any interference with their rights. They know nothing about doing good and suffering for it and taking it patiently, because they lack that faith in God, which is the inner light and inspiration of the whole Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount presupposes the recognition of the Father who seeth in secret, and who knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Take this away, and the discourse would fall shrunk and lusterless as a dead fish. In fact, the discourse would cease to exist if this element were withdrawn. Allusion to the bearing of the Father's recognition and power on actions commanded runs throughout, not taking into account the Lord's Prayer, in which it comes to a brilliant focus. No true judgment of the discourse can be formed if this is left out of view. It is the beautiful underglow of the whole, a man who sees God as this discourse requires who loves him as the discourser did, who has the faith in him that he commands, would be the last man on earth to be spiritless or vapid or slothful. There probably lives not the man whose conformity to it has been perfect in all particulars, but there are measures of attainment in the case, and it will remain an inconvertible truth to the end of the world that those who come most nearly to the commandments of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount are the most interesting and lovable of the human race.